In this Inspired Insider.com interview, we talk with Joe Polizzi. He's the founder of the Content Marketing Institute. He talks about how he grew it to over $3 million a year. He also talks about how he got big brands such as AT&T, Petco, LinkedIn, many more, and even how he got Kevin Spacey as a keynote speaker as one of his talks. That and much more. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm honored to have Joe Polizzi. He's the founder of Content Marketing Institute, which is the leading content marketing resource for enterprise brands. They were recognized as the fastest growing business media company by Inc. Magazine in 2013 and grew to over $3 million a year. The Content Marketing Institute has offered consulting to enterprise brands such as AT&T, Petco, LinkedIn, and many others. All right, if that wasn't enough, they founded the annual event called the Content Marketing World. This year, I was looking at their page, Kevin Spacey is the keynote, and past events have had over 1,700 attendees. Joe's written several books, including the one I just listened to, Epic Content Marketing. It's really good, you should check it out. Joe's delivered keynote speeches for organizations, including Dell, South by Southwest, HP, and many more. Joe, thank you so much for taking the time today. Jeremy, it is a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me, and thanks for going through all that litany, <laughs> litany of, of uh, successful stuff. So yes. it's, 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 it's great to see the success because there have been a lot of mistakes along the way. I'm sure we'll talk yes. about those. Which we'll dig into because from the outside, people are like, well, you know, Joe has it all. He's done it all. He, you know, talks to these big brands. He consults with them. But we're going to talk about how you got there. And I always like to include a fun fact um, before we get into the big lessons and the journey. And a fun fact about Joe that most people don't know is you grew up in a funeral home. Tell us about that. Well, yeah, actually, I didn't uh, like wasn't born in a funeral home, but I, <laughs> I come from. I come from a long line. My grandfather ran a funeral home basically for all of his career. That's what he did. Passed that down to my uncle. And I worked there for four years myself from about 16 to 20 years old. And, uh, you know, it was just a natural part of being being in our family. I mean, I was at the funeral home all the time, uh, you know, doing odds and ends, just watching my grandfather work. And then it, probably the best part about it for me was being able, when I was 16, actually to go into the back room. I'm not going to get into the details of it, but watching him work. And there's a there's like a back office and a front office that's so critical to, to f the funeral home business. Of course, you know, the back office is what it is. But what you realize is that funeral home directors, they have two things. One is they're amazingly compassionate people. And the second thing is they have the best senses of humor on the planet. And I think you have to, because if you take your job too seriously, you can really get weighted down with what's going on around you. Yeah. And they really do, they're really great at distancing themselves. And I learned that just from, okay, you have to, you know, be in the moment with the customer and then you have to do what you have to do because it's not about, it, it's about the family. It's always about the family and, and just learn so much being part of that atmosphere. That is heavy stuff. Cause I can go to someone's funeral and I don't know them and I'm like tearing up and emotional. So I can't imagine being it day in day out. What did you do there? Uh, well, I was a I was a runner. Uh, so basically, what ha what happened is there's a whole system that happens when you close the casket. So as the casket is closing, there's all the flowers around the casket. Well, I you basically went in there and I took all those flowers and I put those in the car in the truck at the time. And my job was to before anyone else got out to the gravesite, I had to make sure the flowers were there. So I basically broke all kinds of traffic laws. <laughs> to get there you have to and, yeah and make sure and because you wanted to make sure that the family saw that that was a big deal to say oh my god how did that happen and and whatever um and if, and i was that back there i assisted with some embalming and things like that but that wasn't my my major that's issue that's the gruesome well, part of the job uh you know it i guess when you're not the, the, I mean, I've seen some things. I'm not. I don't want to go into detail and spook. I've, out I've, your you know, had but, taken anatomy, well, been cadaver lab. So I. Well, I mean, yeah. the the biggest when when the first time I saw a, 
a young child that passed away. Mm. That was emotional. I'd never seen that before. And the, the, the biggest issue that was me that maybe, maybe hit me the hardest was one, the first time I saw a suicide. Oh, wow. Uh, basically, a guy shot himself in the head. And that was, um, you know, that was hard to take. And, 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 and here's the thing. So you don't realize what happens. As the funeral director, our job, funeral home, we have to make sure that person looks like that they would, could get up and walk around that they look so much like themselves because we want to have really good memories of that person and our memories with them. So some of the things I saw my grandfather and my uncle do were works of art and magic that they were able to do that. So, I mean, I just, I mean, they'd be back there for hours doing their thing. And, and, and I think that most people to go to a funeral home, you don't realize the amount of work that goes into that. My grandfather patented a color, a skin tone, uh, because he wasn't happy with any of what the manufacturers were giving him. And he started, started working one up and said, this is the best. This is the most natural thing we can do. And wow. so he's just an amazing entrepreneur and, and somebody I can learn from. Yeah. So what did you learn as an entrepreneur that you took today to the Content Marketing Institute from those days? I think, boy, a lot of it is just treat people like you want to be treated. Be completely respect, respectful. Give people their time. Uh, I think the one thing that we've learned in our business model is that if we can give more, I mean, that's the essence of content marketing is actually giving the knowledge you have and sharing that knowledge and actually over delivering on your expertise. And I think that's really what I learned. And a lot of, I learned a lot of things from my grandfather and my uncle, but I think that was really the key because he would give and he would give and give and give until he had, it's almost like, where do you find all this time? He would sit down. He would take meetings in the middle of the night with families. He would go above and beyond at all times. And from a customer service standpoint, I couldn't believe it. And I think from that, I probably learned the fact that, wow, if we just keep giving and giving and all this information that people are like saying, I'm, I don't have to pay for this. This is free. I can't believe it. And I think a lot of our readers and, and our customers that we have, they're like, I can't believe you're so generous. I was just at a conference last week and I had somebody from 3M come up to me and said, I can't believe how generous you are as an organization. I love hearing that because if- Why did if, they say that? What did you do for them that, um, that made them we, say that? It basically was uh, talking about our daily blog posts that we give away, our free eBooks that we give away. And what the person was talking about is it basically constructed a whole content marketing program on our framework and our framework is free. Like we don't charge for any of it. We say here, please use it. So I love to hear that. Now you might be asking, well, how do you get revenue from that? We don't get revenue right away, but already this, you know, this person's going to end up coming to our event, going to end up getting more active in what we're doing. Did we get the sale in the first two months, two years? No. Are we going to generate a lot of revenue from that uh, for a lot, many years to come? Absolutely. Uh, but sometimes it just takes patience and a lot of giving. So tell me about the early days or even right before when you started Content Marketing Institute. First of all, it was just a tough decision. I was working at Penton Media, which is, uh, if you're not familiar with Penton, it's the largest independent business media company in North America. They publish in uh, mechanical systems and organic foods and a lot of hardcore manufacturing that if you're not in that industry, you wouldn't know the brands, Machine Design, Industry Week, New Hope Media, whatever the case is. Uh, I was working there and I started to run, uh, 2000 started there and then we got hit by 2001 and the economy just tanked. And uh, when I started there, the stock was, I think, $33 a share and 18 months later, it was down to seven cents. Wow. And <laughs> I said, boy, I, I thought really you were going to say $7. More. Wow. I, no, I really added a lot of value <laughs> to the organization. Um, and I, there was actually, when I started, there, was, there were eight people between myself and the CEO. And 18 months later, I was reporting to the CEO. Wow. So a lot of horrible things happened to a lot of people. And it, it was regretful. But I guess from a career standpoint, it, it worked for me because I was cheap. I mean, let's be honest, I, I wasn't making a lot of money. Uh, I was, they were able to promote me to areas because they didn't have to pay me a lot of money. And I basically said, I'll work my butt off for you. And it worked out really well. So I got into this area, which it wasn't called content marketing at the time. It was really called custom publishing or custom media. And I started meeting with a lot of chief marketing officers, senior level marketers, and 
just trying to explain the art of content marketing was, was painful. Um, because they were spending most, mostly every, spending on paid media, that, you know, paid advertising, uh, trade shows, maybe some PR, but not many people were, had uh, pro, content programs that were mature at all. Maybe they were doing a custom magazine, maybe a newsletter, but not much. So I understood a, a couple of things. I'm like, boy, everybody calls it something different. Sometimes it was brand journalism. Sometimes it was custom media, custom content, uh, corporate media. Customer media was big in Europe. I'm like, this is horrible because I've got to change the way that I talk every meeting I go into. But as we were getting into 05, 06, I'm like, there's something to this. As social media was coming around, as search was coming around, I realized, look, none of that stuff is going to work unless you have a really good, solid content marketing strategy. I'm like, oh, this could be something big and decided in about 2006, but actually launched in 2007, the idea for what is now Content Marketing Institute was to be the e-harmony for content marketing. So we were going to match up brands with, comp with, uh, with agencies that offered certain services. We'd be the middle, middle person. We'd match that up. And we'd like, oh, this is fantastic. The only problem is we, we focused on agencies as the people that were going to pay us. And to anyone that is creating any kind of business model off of thinking that agencies are going to pay you money, it's crazy. Agencies, and I have a lot of people that are, my friends in agencies, I can say this, agencies are the cheapest people on the planet. They don't spend money for anything if they don't have to. And we based our whole business model on that, which is a whole other challenge. So, I mean, that's how we got to this point. I saw the opportunity. I knew it was going to be there. I always wanted to be an entrepreneur, you know, watching my, you know, my father and mother, they ran a restaurant, uh, you know, of course, the funeral home story. I knew I wanted to do that. I saw an opportunity and went with the business model and right away we're like we're in trouble because i can't monetize it so there was a reason you started with the agencies though why did you start with the agencies well i was coming so we were a publishing agency so at pet media we were the internal agency if you will or an internal publishing agency so i understood my biggest pain point was driving leads. Mm. How do I get new business? How do I drive leads? I'm like, oh my gosh, well, if we created a resource where we could uh, attract brands to this around this really good content and stuff we were giving away and some of our lead gen stuff that we were doing and then match them up, I'm like, what a great service because it was all, it was all about cold calling. It was all about cold calling, shaking hands, going to trade shows, you know, just not that it's old world. I mean, that stuff's still done. But we weren't using any of the new technology that was available, nothing online. There was no lead gen. I'm like, wow, we can go in. We could be the resource. We could do something fantastic. And it worked really well. I mean, we, we matched up about 1,000 projects to some really big companies, uh, signed some multi-million dollar deals with, uh, for some of our agency partners. And the, I mean, if you want, I can go into this story because it was, it was heartbreaking. Uh, this was in 2009. And uh, we just we just closed a really big deal for one of our agency partners. And I'm like, oh, my God. And it was actually it was time to recur, um, get that agency back on subscription to sign up again for the service, a subscription service for agencies. And I'm like, oh, this is fantastic. It's a great time to call. And I called them and I say, hey, congratulations on landing that million dollar deal. I'm glad we could help out, whatever. It's time to it's time to re up your program. It was four thousand dollars. They just landed a million dollar deal. It was four thousand dollars, and I talked to the the CEO, and she said, "Well, we're going to use that money in different ways. We just didn't see the kind of return we were looking for." And my jaw hit the table, and I'm like, "I won't use her name." I said, "I can't do any better than giving you a million dollar deal." I mean, what are you talking about? It's like, "Oh no, we think we could use that four thousand dollars in different ways." I'm sorry, but thank you so much. It was a great experience, and I'm dumbfounded. I couldn't. I'm like, and that's that's what you have when with working with with agency side. Even though I I love the the agency people, so we we're like, okay, we're you know we were done. I mean, I that was the point where I was it was in the backyard, and I'm like. I can't believe I got to go back and work for somebody else. This is the way, because <laughs> this is our best example. And we weren't able to close it, or I wasn't able to close it. And I honestly didn't know what I was going to do. So how were you able to close or help them close that? Because, and then you transitioned to just going direct to them, right? You mean, how did I, how did I uh, get the big project in for them? Right, because if you could get the big project for them, then you're thinking, well, I could just do this for myself. Well, that's where it, where it came to. So we started to... 
um, create a lot of content online, a lot of how-to information that would draw brands in about content marketing, what it is, how to do it, strategies behind it. I started on the speaking circuit talking about it, you know, released the book, was trying to draw enough people to us and started to draw a lot of brands uh, as, a, as an audience, so it worked really well. And then they would come in, they would fill out a little form, just like if you were going on a date for eHarmony. It's the same way, oh, here's what I am, here's my industries, here's my likes and dislikes, here's what I'm looking for. We matched them up with, you know, I had a, it was basically half computer algorithm, half human intervention. And we would look at it and say, oh, okay, here's the three that's for you. We would match them up, we would deliver the leads. You know, they would go ahead and go through the process, they would choose one and, and done. And, um, and basically, after that incident happened, where I was completely devastated, I remember this. I was in the backyard, and I'm like, "Okay, I'm gonna have to, you know, I'm gonna have to go back and work for somebody else." And then after I stopped being feeling sorry for myself for a little while, I said, "Okay, let's give it another run." And completely at that point, pivoted, switched the model completely, and said, "Okay, well, we're drawing." To your point, it seems like common sense, right? At the time, it did. But yeah, it's like, well, just go after the brands that you're uh, attracting. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's great. So we just have to we go are, through that probably to realize it though at the I, time. I know, it's yeah. so crazy, but it's funny. I mean, so maybe someone listening to this will not have to go through that. <laughs> like that. Well, that's the hope, right? Yeah. And, you know, it's funny. If somebody asked me the other day, well, would you go through that process again or would you go directly to brands? And I have to say, I probably would because I don't know if I would have made it there, right? I don't know if I would have realized. Sometimes you have to go through that failure. Yeah to get to the successes. So we ended up switching that model and I knew a lot because I grew up in publishing, at least from Pet Media and was there for seven years. I'd launched, helped to launch a number of publishing brands for brands and, and for, uh, for publishing companies. And I'm like, well, shoot, let's just use the tried and true publishing model. And that's what we switched. So we, that's when we became the Content Marketing Institute. And we said, okay, we're going to go after senior level marketers. And we're going to, and I said, at that moment, we said, we're, I'm going to launch the leading resource online. We're going to launch the leading magazine and we're going to launch the, the leading trade show, the leading event for the industry. This was in the end of 2009, started working on those in 2010 and they all launched in 2011. So January of 11 was the magazine. Well, the website was May of 2010. Uh, then January was the magazine and then uh, 11, September of 11 was the big our first big content marketing world show and now all of them are the leading <laughs> it's just kind of funny yeah they are, are all the leading resources at this time it, it just took a long time to get there but that pivot moment about changing and saying look we have something what are we doing really well we are doing this education thing well and let's just monetize that audience instead of over here and what i realized was if you target brands agencies will come there's really no reason to target agencies at all for anything. Because if you target brands and brands show up, brand marketers in this case, agencies will always show up. So we never have to market to agencies. Well, I can think of a reason. You know, I can think of a reason. I, I think you know, maybe was there anything in your mindset that said, well, they'll overflow and then they'll just, it'll be easier or, or something like that, or maybe a little easier to get agencies. Or were you just used to the agency model and that's why you went with it? Um, I mean, when I originally went with it, I really, I, I thought that we had hit the jackpot with a model. I mean, there were actually, there was, uh, there was another, there's a model called agencyfinder.com and Chuck Meist runs that business. He does a great job and he basically hooked for traditional agencies. He did what we wanted to do in content marketing for traditional agencies. I saw his model. He was doing fantastic. He had everything rolling. And I'm like, wow, we could just replicate that model and do it, do it for content marketing and never realized how hard it was going to be. And by the way, just so you have an idea, that the model that we had in 2007 it was called Junta42 at the time was the name of the company. And it's, it's called, in a lot of ways, called Contently right now. Contently is another company that's doing fantastic and they just got $9 million in seed capital. Right, yeah, yeah. So congratulations. They've taken that. They've done much better with that, but they've, you know, we won't get into their model, but they, they did it a little bit differently because they could control the experience a little bit more and, uh, and hats off to them. But what we realized was, Hey, you know, let's just go after and keep educating brand marketers. And we had the audience, but I had to figure out how we were going to generate revenue from that audience. Though. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, when you go from the agency to the big brand, 
oftentimes the first client is the hardest. How did you get that first big client when you when you pivoted? The in looking back at it now, and I talk about this when I give speeches to entrepreneurs about how they should kind of go to market. Uh, I talk about the, uh, the the triumvirate or the three legs of the stool, which are blog, a book, and speaking. So those are the three things that we went that I went out with personally to build relationships, and that's how we got our first client. Uh, and I actually, I don't I forget, I think it was Alcatel Lucent was the first one that we actually got where I was doing a speech for and then ended up doing a little bit of consulting. And that was because of the blog and the book where somebody connected to me, oh, this is what we need. Our company needs this, called me up and was doing that. And I always look at that. So anybody listening to this, I really do believe, like, think about how a stool, um, you know, you have the three thin legs of the stool. Well, if you don't have one of those legs, the other, let's say you have two legs left, they have to be really thick tools, uh, 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 legs to the stool to make it work. Well, if you take away two of those and you have one, it better be a really, <laughs> like you're, you're sitting on a log. One big log, right, it's yeah. One big. That's how you have to think about those three. So if you said, and so we, and I, I do from, you know, my blog strategy, my book strategy, and my speaking, and they sort of all play off each other. I don't know where we would be without one of those. But if you said, look, I can't do a book, you take that away, you say, okay, well, your blog and your speaking has to be that much better to compensate for the fact that right. you don't have a book. Well, why would you, you know, someone who says, you, I can't do a book, would you tell them, well, you can do a book? And, and how did you start, you know, obviously you had to produce your first book. How was that experience? Well, first of all, I would ask, well, why can't you produce your right. own book? Right. I mean, there's all different. You don't have to be a good writer to do a book. I mean, there's all kinds of resources out there to do it if you really wanted to. Um, the reason why a book is so important because it opens doors to speaking. There, are, for the big events, if you wanted to speak at, in a lot of cases, if you're not a client side, you have to be an author. Like they won't even consider you if you don't have a book because they're trying to drive attendance. So you have to think about it from their perspective. You have to have a web, be a well-known author or you have to be client side to drive. I mean, we run events so that we run in a, in a similar way to that. Um, when we started, I used the blog to book strategy and did it strategically because I'm not one that can sit down for a couple weeks in a cabin and, do, and write a book. Right. Uh, well, you're running a business. Well, you can't. Well, yeah. Can't I mean, we're that. busy, right? I mean, that's what I hear about blogging and creating content. Like I'm running a business. The thing that you got to realize, at least for us today, it is, is part of your business today is communicating and yeah. sharing content on a consistent, you're, you know, you're, you're not only, you only, not only sell what you sell, but you're also a media company. You have to realize that at the same time. And the sooner you do, the easier it'll be for you. Um, but as, as I, I co-authored the first book, Get Content, Get Customers with Newt Barrett, and when we started talking about it, I said, oh, okay, I'll take the first half of the book, which I did as was the why, the how, the strategy, and Newt did all the case studies. He did all the interviews, which was great. So it was great to work with a partner on the first one. And I basically started to blog post out the chapters. So it's, so, oh, today I got to do the why content marketing or history of content marketing or whatever. And I wrote it as a blog post and I kept going. And by the time I was at the six month mark, I pretty much had 75% of the book done and then it's just sort of tweaking and moving around. Epic content marketing was done exactly the same way. 75% and my apologies to everyone, but honestly, if 75% of that book, you could find I've produced in one way or another, mm -hmm. and, but I, I just put it a format, 25% is new material in that, but I brought it all together in one resource and I learned that from Seth Godin. I mean, Seth Godin is the master. And if you look at any of his books, that's exactly what he's done for the most part. The Big Dip was, exa that's exactly, he tells you. Right. These are my blog posts. I put them together for you. And what I realized is the $15 that you charge somebody for a book, it's a real value if you actually just organize it for right, them. Right, for sure. But that's really what we were doing. Yeah. So I know you, you got a lot of traction and I wanna hear about, you know, one big turning point was your pivot point. And I know that you grew, I mean, from 2009, from over 200,000 to 2012 to over 3 million. What were some of those big turning points along the way for you? 
Uh, as we were growing, I think the biggest thing I had to realize was that I had to start giving up control. Um, it was, it's, it's difficult. And I talk with a lot of entrepreneurs that are sole proprietors and you grow a business. What you realize is that you, you do everything. I mean, I was, I remember Saturdays every month for a Saturday, I would spend the whole day doing financials. I'm not great at financials, but I would do that. Um, I was doing, you know, I was, I was setting a lot. I was setting all my own appointments, uh, which, when you had, you know, I felt I had to do. Right. But then I realized that I actually, I can't remember. Um, actually, I think it was Scott Maxwell at OpenView, one of my mentors. And he said, you have to start looking at the value of your time and what you're good at and what you're not good at. And I actually went through that exercise and started to say, here's what I enjoy. Here's what I'm good at. Here's where I'm going to, to be an asset to grow, really grow this right. business from, like how you said, from 09 to 13 and 14. And here's the things I'm not very good at that aren't a good use of my time. Yeah. And, then, and then started to find people to help me with those roles and we could actually grow a business. You know, talking to my mentor, Scott Maxwell, basically he went through the idea that I've got to figure out what my time is worth. And the things that I was, and I realized then that I was doing a lot of things that weren't of value. So financial is not a good use of my time. I'm not good at it. I don't like it. I don't add a lot of value there. Uh, strategy, things like talking with customers, speaking, writing, those things were of value. They were driving the business. And, and as I started to find people to do some of those things that I wasn't very good at, that's when the business really started to go. As I say, okay, as we were, as we said, okay, well, 2009, we're going to do an event. We're going to do a magazine. It's a lot of stuff. Uh, Even one yeah, of those I don't, is a I'm lot not of an stuff. expert in, in, in most of any of those. I'm really good at selling. I'm really good at strategy. Um, so we had, I had to start bringing people on and realize that we could do that through 1099 yeah. and contractors they didn't have to hire people, but filled in the gaps where I, where I didn't have the expertise. Yeah. And this is interesting about your book, actually, because you talk about this and, and even when you look at the Inc 500 page, what, when you look closely, it's probably one of the only ones that you look at the employees, it goes from one to two on that page. But what you did that was amazing that you talk about in the book too, which is you had tons of contractors and people helping create the stories. How did you decide to go that route and how did you, you know, recruit them? It was a model, the, the contractor model is something that if you work in an agency or a publishing agency, we're very used to using that. So like when we did, uh, we did a magazine for the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Uh, on staff, we would have the account manager and maybe a designer. And then there probably would be 15 to 20 people, writers, designers, production people that were all freelance. So that freelance model, I was very used to it. I actually got to a point and still believe this in a lot of cases that that is the best possible model for us in media. Uh, and actually in, in some businesses, I would agree that that's a better model to go to. So many people are focused on, oh, I've got to, I've got to make sure I hire these people. Well, what, what, what's an advantage to us? So I took that model into what we do at the Content Marketing Institute. In any one month, we might work with 30 to 40 different mm -hmm. contractors on different things. What you realize is that those people are really super talented. They want flexible hours. They want to work on their time. They don't want to be told when to do something, but they'll get their job done. And you can't get that kind of talent unless you're flexible like that. Right. So I think it opened us up to working with people that nor, you know, nor other companies wouldn't be able to do because we were okay with where it said, Hey, just get the job done. Here's what we need. Here's uh, here's how much we're going to pay for it. They're like, fantastic. I'll, I do my work Saturday nights. Fantastic. That's no problem. And, and that's how we roll. And we have over, you know, this year we'll probably have well over 300 contributors to the blog and probably another 50 to 60 paid contractors at, at any one time. And it's a model that just works really well for us. I mean, that has its own challenges too. How do you manage all that? Uh, well, <laughs> thankfully, I'm not doing, I'm not involved in that. So we have uh, somebody that works with all of our contractors and they make sure they get the 1099 information and works with them on the timing. And of course, there's, a, there's QuickBooks and there's project management software in there as well and it works fantastic for us. We have, a, we have an accountant that handles all of our books and makes sure that that's done. And 
and there's a whole swapping of the file as we go before. But how go- do you find them? Because you again, like you maintain the highest quality content. Mm-hmm. What what's your vet process for bringing someone on? The fir- the the most important thing, in my opinion, is to get those leaders to manage the process first. So, you know, like Michelle Lynn, who's our content director, she was like the first person that we contracted with. She's not full time, but she is in charge of. She's our content director at Content Marketing Institute, and actually, uh, I saw her on Twitter. I saw what she was doing until I got Twitter. She was talking about content marketing. I like what she was doing. I checked out her page. I reached out to her through a contact to the contact form. And I said, Michelle, I really like what you're doing. You know, can we, can we chat? And so I was watching and that's why when I talk to people that are looking for a job, I always say, you know, if, if you have a blog, it's a competitive advantage because that's the first thing I look at. I look at how they communicate. I look at their social media presence and I look at their blog and I can tell in my opinion, 90% of what I would want to work with them about there. It's already out there. I don't have to ask them. I know I can see it out there. Once I got, we got that. Then we put a list together of here's the types of people we call them influencers. Here's the type of people we would want to work with and want to write on our blog. And we started to share their content and we started to promote them so that we could build a relationship with these people because they didn't know us. So we're like, how do we get them to write for us? How do we get them to share our content? Well, we started sharing their content first. And then we started to take those influencers. We had about a list of about 40 that we went through. And then we started to take their content. We started to bake it into our eBooks and our white papers. Because when you do that then, and then you let them know, hey, Jay Bear, you're on page nine. Right. Uh, that we focused on your case study. You know what Jay does? Jay shares that <laughs> with his audience. And that's how we built our audience. And that's how we build a relationship with Jay. And now... Jay and I are really good friends, and I think a lot of that has to do with you know, we were sharing his content a long, long time ago and identified him as an influencer. So that's kind of how we work that. And now we get probably four to five people a day wanting to contribute to the site, and now it's a vetting process where we have to go. We look at what they do. We give them the blog guidelines, and then we usually give everybody a shot. Like, you know, if it goes well... We'll ask you back, and if it doesn't, then you know it didn't work out. Right. So also, Joe, I want to hear from you. Um, when a new client comes on, what kind of things do you do with them? Because I think it would apply to any, whether it's small, medium, or enterprise business. What do you start with, and kind of what do you coach them on to do? So we've moved a lot from consulting to training. Um, We used to do a lot more consulting and we're really trying to get out of the consulting business into the training and advisory business. But I think the one thing that we learn and when we were going through our competitive set, so we've done, we've had a couple, the Petco deal is actually, it's an, I don't want, I can't go into too much detail, but we were up against a number of really big companies for that project. What we realized is, is that when we go up against some of these other companies, they were they were talking about, they're trying to sell the sun, moon, and stars. Here's all the great things that we can do. And I know you only asked for this, but we're going to, we going to give you all this stuff. Well, what we end up doing with most of our advisory programs, they ask for something. We give them the absolute smallest. We give them the first step. We what say, are they we asking for about, when they come to you or any of these other places? What are they looking for? They're usually something on the framework, right? There's something about, okay, I need, we don't have a content marketing strategy. We need, why would they even think Uh, that they need one? I mean, obviously they're reading online, but the, the only way to get there, in my opinion, the only, when somebody reaches out to us and fills our content form, they're in pain. They've, they're going some pain they're going through because what happens is they say something's not working in the organization. Let's say for example, that they can't get any traction on social media can't figure it out. They'll start where for everybody go. They go to Google, right? They start typing in challenges with social media, whatever. And they usually end up on one of our pieces of content. And they're like, Oh, I like this, this whole content marketing strategy thing. We need one of those or whatever. So then they'll go in contact form. They'll come in that way. Or in a lot of cases, they'll be at an event where we're speaking at an event. Or the best part is, is when they're at an event and somebody else is talking about us sharing our research, whatever. And that we get a lot of business that way. It's like, I had, I heard about you at so-and-so's event. They were talking about some of the stuff you're doing or some of your research. So it's all, somebody has to be in some sort of pain and we focus on 
those people that are going through that pain instead of trying to evangelize those that don't know it yet. When they get there and they realize it, then they'll come to us. But we don't, we're not focused on them yet. So you were saying about the Petco. So you give them the smallest amount. We, we Yeah, we basically say, because it's so, agency is our, they want the execution. They don't want the strategy. So this is like a, the dirty word on the agent. Like they want the big production creative. They want to go through that whole thing. So, you know, they could do a, you know, a 200,000 to a million dollar proposal when it's not necessary. What we want to do is we just want to build a relationship. We want a foot in the door and we want to, and, and th I do actually believe this though. I would say, look, that creation and all that production and stuff that will come. But if we don't do this step one, none of that matters because everybody wants to run to execution and we, and, and most companies from a content marketing st standpoint don't even have a strategy. So we're like, look, we've got to get the strategy first, at least a hypothesis set, or why are we doing this stuff in the first place? So we set that up and that's always our first step. Like it's a discovery session or it's something that we like, look, this is the minimum amount. It's not a lot of money. We get in the door and then we build that relationship with them. And then that turns out to be a long-term customer. So what is for us. that initial small step with, what do you do with the strategy? Because I know in the book you mention, um, you know, what do you focus on to dominate one channel? Is that part of it? Um, the, the consulting part and advisory part is probably the smallest thing that we do. The, we're, that translates into your online training platform though, right? It does. Actually, what we're trying to do is we're trying to affect the most people possible where we can. So, and, and we do the advisory and we do the consulting because we want to keep our hands dirty. We want to continue to learn. But yeah, what we did was we said, look, we, not everybody can come to content marketing world. Not, we can't be everywhere at one time doing consulting, but what can we do? We can create an online platform and educate anybody anywhere in the world through this. And we've been working on it for about a year and finally got to point just launched this week, Congrats. actually. Thank you. It was a lot of pain to get there. And we have, I think we're launched with 33 different sessions from 18 different speakers about how do you start with the plan, the strategy and go forth and, and get that thing done. And that, that's where, that's our, really our international strategy because I didn't, we didn't want to do a content marketing world Europe. We don't want to do a content marketing world India. Uh, but we have a, one in Sydney and we have one in North America. So we're like, okay, well, what do we do with the rest of the country? Because 30% of our audience is international and it's growing. So that was, our, that, that was the way we went to market there and we could affect the largest number of people. So in that online training platform, now that you know, doesn't just apply to enterprise clients. Small, medium businesses obviously are using it too. Um, what are some of those first few steps that you recommend that's on the, the training platform? The number one thing is figure out why. There's really, we got to find our sweet spot from when it comes to content marketing. Because as we said, we're all publishers, we're all media companies, right? And our co we have to realize that our, comp our customers don't care about us, they don't care about our products, they don't care about our services. They only care about themselves. And most of the content we're sharing as businesses is about us. They don't care about that. Not that that stuff isn't right. important, but it's only important at a very small portion of the buying process. So what do we do 99% of the time? We have to figure out how we're going to get and keep attention. And it's really the intersection between what we're really good at, what we know, what's our IP, what's our expertise, and what our customers really need to know. And the intersection of that, if you look at figure that as two circles, the intersection of that is what we call the yeah. sweet spot. That could be our content marketing niche. That could be like, um, like Procter & Gamble's Homemade Simple. You know, they're talking about organizational tips for the home and really short recipes so that their mo moms on the go can have more time with their families. That's a real, that's a nice niche that they can go into, right? That kind of thing is what we're talking. Open view venture partners, VC company out of Boston. They focus on how startups and entrepreneurs can get more funding and be better at marketing and better financial. They've got a nice little niche. They understand that better. And they've been able to draw 20,000 plus um, subscribers and audience to them because of that. And they're not a media company, right? But they've created a, a media mm -hmm. brand through open view labs. So that's kind of the first step is figure out what that strategy mm -hmm. is and then figure out, is it sales? Is it savings or is it sunshine? You know, why are we doing it? 
Are you doing this to drive sales? Are you doing it to save costs in some way? Or are you doing it to create happier customers? So you've got to figure out why, because this is like the, another dirty little secret. If, when you talk to enterprise brands, anybody, talk to any business and start going through their channels or where they create content, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Pinterest, and just ask them why. Why are you on that platform? You could do it. Just put a little why at the top and list. If you don't have an understanding of why you're on that platform, you probably shouldn't be there. It's no reason that we don't have to be on every platform. We want to focus on the platforms that we're going to get the most out of for our customers yeah. and for our And business. I noticed what you said with all those examples is it's always customer centric. You know, and um, you know, what was a blog post that you remember that did really well or a piece of content that you that the, you know, the Content Marketing Institute put out that did really well that, I mean, you're, you're never surprised about because you did it, but maybe, you know, part of you was surprised because it did way beyond what you thought it was going to do. You know, it's interesting if, um, well, we've done a number of them that was just amazing. It, 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 just the fact that this industry wasn't called content marketing. And when we came out in 2007, I basically just came out with a flag and said, this is kind of, I, like I never even said, oh, we're going to change the name from custom publishing, custom media branded content to content marketing. We just said, what is content marketing? And said, this is what it is. Because what I realized is when I was saying that story earlier about going into all these um, senior level marketers and not being able to, to talk with them, I had, they all called it something different. I said, we're never going to grow as an industry unless we start talking the same language. I can't do this every time. So the fact that whether you like the term content marketing or not, I really don't care. But the fact is what I love is we're actually talking the same language. So I think the what is content marketing post, I wrote that 2007 sometime. We've probably driven, I have to check the numbers. The last time I checked, it was in the hundreds of thousands of business just from that one blog post on that because we end up getting about 300 to 400 people a day just going to that one post. And talk about, I mean, for those people that don't believe in content creation as a business strategy, I mean, that's, so it took me an hour to do that blog post. And there's been hundreds of thousands of people that have gone to that one blog post over that period of time that's related into 50 or, you know, let's say from that blog post, let's say eight to 9,000 subscribers from that post that we've been able to deliver hundreds of thousands in revenues from. Yeah. And that's just amazing, but it's taken a long time to get there. Like it doesn't happen in three months. This has been over a five to six year period. Yeah, and it wasn't by accident either. You didn't just pull that name out of thin air, which you talk about in the book, which you talk about in Google Trends, right? So there was, there's, there's two ways. We, we, I looked at what Google was telling us and I looked at my own experience. So I knew that when I said content marketing to marketers, it was the term of all the terms that was used in the industry about our practice area. It was the one that got them to sit up in their seat. It's like, oh, marketing, content, I get it. It's really simple, right? It's not, or you can sort of figure out what the definition is if you say content marketing. Many people might not be exactly right, but that's okay. They're talking about that. And I started to look at content marketing as we were launching the business, I went in and looked at that from an opportunity standpoint. And I'm like, nobody's talking about content marketing. Very few people are even mentioning the term content marketing at all. I said, there's an opportunity that we could dominate this, this area, but if we could put a little publishing behind it and get people to talk about it, and that's exactly what happened. It doesn't always work that way, but I love to use Google Trends because what I could see was custom publishing was the term for the industry and it was going down, it was trending down. And there was nobody that was to inbound marketing was coming in there. There was a couple other things, but nobody was taking a leadership stance. I said, wow, we have a, actually have an opportunity from a publishing standpoint to dominate that term. And, you know, it, it worked out that way, but it, it you know, took us about two, three years to get there. Right, right. And I know from on a content perspective, it's interesting what you talk about in the book about gated versus ungated and that you do 90 percent ungated. How do you decide what to gate and maybe explain to people what, what you mean by gate and ungate, but how do you decide what to have it readily available and what to put sure. behind a gate? Um, so gated content is something with a form in front of it. So it'd be like a white paper or an ebook or a webinar with a form in front of it. 
Um, this has been changing over the past few years, but you know, when we got started in this business in 07, 08, all the really good content had a form in front of it because it's all used for lead generation purposes. Right. Now, the thing is, is that, and that's fine. If your goal is lead generation, then you can have a gate, gate in front of it. You can have a form in front of it. That's fine. But the issue is, is that a lot of people are trying to get found in search and you're trying to do something in social media, whatever that goal is. And if you put a gate in front of that content, it's not going to work for you. People aren't going to share it. People aren't going to link to it. So you've got to make sure you open that up and really give away a lot of information. So any of that top of the funnel information, that's all the how-to stuff, um, maybe some top line research stuff, the stuff that you might think, oh, we could do an ebook and gate it, give it away. Make because you want people to share it, you want people to talk about it, you want that top of the level, top of the funnel type of information that people actually know about you. If you gate that stuff, none of you're not gonna hit any of those goals. Once you get to mid-level, you start getting to maybe some, you could be start, start talking about maybe a, a method for how you go to market or you're giving away some really, really in-depth stuff that's still good, but you, know, you, you, you might say, okay, this is where somebody's interested, could be interested in getting to our product or they're starting to make a product decision. You can gate that kind of information. That's a mid-funnel level. I have no problem with that. And then when you get back down to right before conversions, they're talking about price sheets, um, any type of demos like that, you should open those up as well. So that's kind of where I would look at. And most of that content, the top and bottom, that's 90% of your content. That should be free, flowing, and open. And if you gate that content, you just have to realize that a lot of people aren't going to share it and it's going to be harder to find on Google. What was something that you gated that you were on the fence about but it proved to be that was the, the right choice. To gate the yes. content? We've been starting, now that we have so much, so basically we, we do 365 blog posts a year, one every day that we release every day, and we do about 10 to 12 eBooks a year on that. We, half of those are gated, half of those are free depending on what the goals are. If the goal is shareability, like our 50 content marketing predictions of the year where we're talking about a lot of influencers, we want that to be shared out, free, whatever, put it on SlideShare, put it on the blog, let it go. Then we have, and we just had came, this, came out with this about three months ago, it was basically the guide to content marketing strategy, 36 questions. We said, wow, this is how somebody can really start up. Somebody who's interested in doing a content marketing strategy, so they already sort of get what content marketing is, so it's sort of mid-funnel, they already get it. This is a really good one that we could set up as a gated form so we could get more subscribers. That's what we use as our main subscriber generator. That's worked fantastic for us. So we use a pop-up form in association with some calls to action on the site as well as SlideShare that we generate, uh, you know, about 100 to 120 subscribers a day. That's great. And that's how, that's how we generate, and most of them is, is through that ebook. And we've swiped, we, that was 100 content marketing examples, but we were using that as gated and it wasn't performing as well because it was still should have been more top of the funnel. And then when we got to more of the documented strategy stuff, we realized that's a better gated piece of content and that's worked out much better for yeah. us. And, you know, Joe, I want to hear some of the big lessons you learned not only because like you have all these legs, you have the Institute, you have content marketing world. What's a big lesson for that you've learned so far with content you know, marketing Institute and then the a whole nother, um, you know, thing with, with actually putting on a, a huge seminar. Well, I've learned, <laughs> I don't know how much time we have. We, <laughs> we have about talk. 10 hours. Yeah, no, right, exactly. I mean, I, the, the one thing is, is from a content perspective focus. I mean, we really set out, and this is what a lot of businesses don't do. So if you're trying to figure out you know, what, your, what our content marketing strategy should be, most businesses try to boil the ocean with content. Oh, we got to talk about financial stuff. We got to talk about this and that and whatever. And they try to cover everything. And they're basically jack of all trades, master of none. We, um, we didn't make that mistake. So we basically are the how-to of content marketing. We've been doing that for five years now. We've really focused on how-to information and content marketing and being the leading expert in the world at that. And that has opened up all the opportunities that we have to do the event, to do the magazine, whatnot. The other thing is, is that uh, the magazine is actually a really good example. So somebody said, Joe, why would you launch a print magazine? 
Well, our print magazine goes to a different audience. It's a different buyer persona that we target. That's basically senior level marketing decision maker we target with the magazine, where in the, on the website and also in the event, we target the people doing the work, the managers, the social media people, the content strategists that are really doing the work, that's for them. And then what we try to do is get buy-in through the magazine so that the CMOs will say, hey, what's this content marketing stuff? And say, we should be doing more of that and get budgetary approval for that. So that's the decisions that we've made. And mm -hmm. I guess the, the, where, where we've succeeded in that respect is actually really understanding what our channels are used for, who we're targeting and what that message is. Yeah. And then they, I don't, a lot of the companies we work with sadly don't do that. And they just say, oh, we need to be doing this or we need to be doing a blog or we need to be on Facebook or it's like, well, why, why are you on there? And you got to go back to the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. So that is a hard thing, but definitely myself included needs to focus, focus, you know, on things. And um, what about with content marketing world? What made you decide to get into, cause that's a whole nother, you know, huge, I would see set of challenges uh, with putting on an event. The, as we were growing the industry, we knew, we, we felt that the industry was ripe for a big event, a South by Southwest type event for the content marketing industry. There were some small shows all over the world, but none of them were sort of the dominant, it's just similar to the Google uh, Trends thing. It's like we saw the opportunity, but nobody was dominant. But from a media, so we're a media business model, which means that most of the people listening to this probably sell a product or service. You use content to draw people in to get and keep attention. So ultimately you can sell more products and services. Our product and services it, are they are it's sponsorship, advertising, or paid content. People that register for events. The one thing, and I've been in this uh, publishing industry long enough to know that you do not want to base your publishing model off of solely off of advertising. I think that it's the worst business model on the planet. It's the th it's the reason why. Uh, you know, Facebook just made their decision to go to WhatsApp because they're trying to not have sole, the sole focus on 90% of their revenue coming from advertising is that's a tough market to go after. We want recurring revenue. So we led, oh, okay, events, that's just where we could drive revenue directly from consumers so that we could have a model where, yeah, we could make it off of sponsors, but we could make it off of our customers as well, our users of content as well. Yeah. And it, it worked out really well. And there's nothing better I mean, if you look at from a media strategy, there's nothing better than an event. Yeah. Um, and it fits in your three, you know, blog, book, speaking. You that's a huge pillar that you know you can invite yourself to speak at your own event, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> well, and the other thing is, I mean, the three the the three legs of the stool of the media stool are print, online, and in person. So that's those are the three we work as well with our. Business so what's model. been a big challenge though? Because it's not easy to put on an event. Oh, wow. Uh, it's hard to, and I go to events. I, I, I go to a couple of events a week that are, are my own. And it's, there's, there's, it's so difficult in when you have sponsors involved to make sure that you sort of draw the line and say, here's sponsors, you're over there. We're really focused on the agenda for the event. The quality of the content has to be there and it has to be yeah. pure. Um, and the other thing is, from a logistic standpoint, our goal and everything we do with the event is to first make sure people are having fun because we're in the entertainment. Most people don't realize that they do events. They think they're in the education business. You're not. You're in the entertainment business. And if you realize you're in the entertainment business, then you do things a little bit yeah. different because if they're not having fun, they're not going yeah. to learn. So we first set it up so they're having fun doing everything. We have little you know, tables at the event that, of food that are all orange because orange is our color. So we have fun there. We bring in keynote speakers like a Kevin Spacey. We do Rick Springfield. A couple of years ago, we had Kevin Smith, Silent Bob come in. During our first year, we do fun things that a normal business to business marketing event don't do. And I think we're able to have a competitive yeah. advantage there. And we're meticulous. We've got an event team that looks at every little thing and walk. we do walkthroughs and make sure, okay, are they gonna see a sign here? Is something missing there? Are somebody gonna be lost here? And we go through that whole process. And I work with a lot of other events that just don't do mm -hmm. that kind of work. So two things, how do you get Kevin Spacey? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was, he Is was he first from on Cleveland? our list this year. Oh, no, okay. he's not, he actually lives in London. Um, Kevin Spacey, I mean, I'm, are you a House of Cards fan? Have you mm -hmm. watched House mm -hmm. of yes. Cards on Netflix? So uh, 
we the whole Netflix content model is it's sort of uh, in our industry where a lot of marketers can learn something from that content distribution model and went after Kevin. Kevin's actually, uh, or Mr. Spacey's involved in the industry quite a bit more than what I realized. And we went out to you know his agent and and made sure it happened and kept on him and and we'd been we'd been working on that for at least six months and just kept going. He was first on the list. We had the secondary ones that we were going after, but really wanted Mr. Spacey. And it just you know determination. It it happened and you know you got to remember too. At the same time, we had another 15 on the list that we would have had to go to, and we were working on angles. Um, I mean, we had William Shatner last year, which was great. Wasn't our first choice, but ended up being. We fantastic. won't tell him that, but yeah. Yeah, it wasn't. I mean, I, I think I, I mean, I'd be happy to tell Bill that I said it wasn't absolutely the first choice, but ended up being the perfect choice for what we were trying to do. But it's it's hard to get even those. I mean, it's it's a lot of money to bring some of these people in. But but man, it's it's so worth it because I just realized, OK, how much does it cost to bring that person in and how many additional tickets do we think we can sell and what is it going to do for our mm -hmm. event and, and if it's going to make an yeah, impact? Yeah. What is the hardest part of putting on the event? Marketing. Absolutely, on the marketing side. I mean, we could we could be meticulous about how we do the logistics of it, but if we don't get butts in seats, it's not worthwhile. I think the one thing that we do that's different. I'll give you an example. There's a big event uh, in our industry going on in London uh, in July. I went to check out, see who they. They don't have any speakers up yet. They don't have any agenda up yet. It just says here's what's coming, and you'll know, and we'll open re registration soon for a July event. Here's where we look. We had a meeting yesterday for 2015 content marketing world. That's 18 months away. So what our goal is, is that by the time we're 12 months out, we have a real good handle on what we're doing, what the theme is going to be. We already, if you look on the site, we already have the speakers. We already have what they're going to talk about. We already have the events going on well ahead of any of our competitors because we have to, that is a, a pure advantage. So if anybody does events, you have to get out in front. The sooner that you start marketing to that, the better it's going to be. And, and that's you know, been a key you know. for us. And I know, you know, Joe, for all of us, we don't accomplish this on our own. Who are some of your mentors and some of the best? You mentioned one before. Who are some of your other mentors and the best advice they've given you? Well, yeah, I mentioned my, my grandfather. Um, my uh, the, the person that hired me at at uh, there are two people that hired me at Penton Media, Jeff Forker and, and Jim McDermott. Um, Jim, Jim was a great influence on me because of the he's the first one that really taught me about the industry of content marketing and, and basically said, look, Joe, we're, we're going to go through a revolution. We're not there yet, but we could see it coming because more and more of the business we got was not through paid marketing or paid advertising. It was through these companies trying to figure out what their story was and they weren't really good storytellers. And he was like, and, and, he, and he introduced me to Don Schultz. Don Schultz is the father of integrated marketing, another mentor of mine, by the way. And what I learned, what was great what Don said, and I have this up on my wall actually in my office. Don says, everything that we do as a company can be replicated today, except for how we communicate. And I really believe, and if you think about that as a business owner, that's hard to take because we think that our right. products and services are so awesome. But if you really think about it, I mean, look at, look at Apple, right? Yeah, everything Apple does can you really can be replicated. You can get in China, right. And yeah. get China. Samsung's actually doing a really good job of taking that lead over from a technology standpoint. But Apple communicates that, that what, what Apple has going for them is their brand and their communication more than anything else. You could say innovation, you could say a lot of things, but it's how we feel about Apple. It's how we perceive Apple because of how they communicate. And I think if we look at that as a business owner, that's what, and Don was great. So if you ever get another book, sort of a, a more of an academic book, is, it's Integrated Marketing Communications is the book, but Don is fantastic. He spoke at Content Marketing World last year as well. So one, another one of my mentors, and I would, I mean, I have to say my parents, the two, th two things about my, my parents, my mom, ultra passionate. I mean, my passion, I get directly from my mom. She, she doesn't do anything less than 110%. So from that, and my dad, his was, his was being available. I mean, there were times we were going through a tough time. Um, he was unemployed for a while. He was out there trying to look for a job. Then he was working long hours at Ford Motor Company. And every time I asked him, dad, you have time for a catch? Dad, you have time to shoot some hoops. He always said yes, even though now I realize the man was dog tired. tired. I don't know how he did it. And 
So, I mean, I probably more than anything else were my mom and yeah, my dad. No, thanks for sharing that. Uh, a good catch between father and son is always good. Oh, man, I just, I can't imagine. I mean, that's what I, happened the other day with my, I've got two boys, 10 and 12. And my oldest is really big into Legos, Lego movie and everything like that. And uh, he called, and I'm reading a book, and I'm almost done. He says, Dad, can you come up and play Lego now? And I said, I will. I'm almost done with my book. And I caught myself. I'm like, come on, you can finish the book later. Put the, put the card in, we'll right. put the book down and go play, play Lego with your son. Because you know what? In a couple of years, he might not ask to right. play Lego. Right. So, and you, you talked about you know, that, that story. What are, what's a tip that someone can use to better tell their story or their brand story? You know, I would really sit down. I mean, you're, anybody listening to this is probably doing a lot of social media. They're trying to figure it out. I would really sit down and ask yourself the question, where can you, you be the leading expert in the world? It's a tough question. Like from an informational standpoint, where can? Not the products and services you sell, but something related to what you know, and what you love, and what you're passionate about. Where can you be the leading expert in the world? And I say that because if you, if you say, oh, I'm going to... Uh, pet supplies. I'm going to be the leading expert in the world on pet supplies. Well, be honest with yourself. Is that absolutely possible when you've got Petco right. and PetSmart and billions of dollars being spent? No. But could you be the leading expert in the world? Let's say you sell, sell a certain kind of pet supplies. Could you be the leading expert in the world in, in uh, targeting an audience of elderly Americans in the Pacific Northwest that like to travel with their pets in RVs? Now, you might say, that's incredibly niche, and I would say, that's perfect. That's exactly what we're looking for. And instead of going wide, we go so niche, because that's the opportunity today. You can be the leading expert, and you can communicate directly with your audience in a particular niche, but you really have to be the expert to cut through that yeah. clutter. So that would be my advice, is to really find that content niche that you yeah. can be the expert. Um, and Joel, you, know, you talked about your dad being busy. You obviously have a lot going on. What is a daily ritual that you find that you do that is essential for you? You know, I was thinking, I know you asked me this question. I was, I was trying to figure out. Um, I have two, I'm so, it's so strange, my home when I'm at home versus on the road. And I just figured this out. When I'm on the road, I rarely sleep. I, I probably am really? on the road 50% of the time. I'm usually up by four in the morning, no matter when I went to bed. I'm up at four and I work and work and work and work and I'm always work, working on the road. When I'm at home, I'm at, I'm at home. I sleep in, I try to spend more time with the kids and, uh, and I get a ton more sleep at home, which is really where my wife is like, what is this? You're sleeping all the time at home and you're not sleeping on the road. But that's sort of, that's sort of how I program myself. And then the other thing that, uh, that I definitely try to do, I know that when I'm not getting things done and I'm not productive, it's because I'm an email too much. So I really try to stay away and do two chunks of email a day if possible in the morning and at the end of the day and try to get projects done during the day because honestly, you can be swept up in email and just stay in email yeah. all day or social yeah. or whatever all day long. And it, it's just it's just a really good way not to get anything done during the day. Yeah. And, you know, you get the email from people saying, I only check it Mondays and Fridays. I only check mm -hmm. it in the morning, even I should have something that says I only check it every five minutes. Well, you know, <laughs> Tim Ferriss, you know, four hour work week. He, if you read that book, he goes through that, right? He says, basically, I had to get right. away from email and I would say, yes. I'm only going to check email on Mondays and whatever. Right. Um, I mean, the other thing, too, by the way, another good thing is outsource some of that and outsource some of those things. I mean, I'm, I've considered for a long time. I haven't done it yet, but I've considered outsourcing my email box and getting I mean, I think there's a possibility to outsource things that we do that we don't like, we're not passionate at, and I'm trying to look at that every day and make right. those decisions. Right. So, Joe, I appreciate your time. You know, I know you're busy. I have one last question, but before I do, I want you to mention some of the things going on now, what's exciting, tell people about, you know, what websites, tell them, um, you know, content marketing world, when it is and everything like that, because they should definitely check it out. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. EpicContentMarketing.com is the book. Uh, please check it out. Obviously, as you know, audio or print or ebook, yep. whatever you want to do. Great on Audible, yeah. Uh, we do two big content marketing worlds. Uh, we have Content Marketing World Sydney, which would be 31st of March. You do two March. of them? We do two. We oh, do wow. one in Sydney, Australia, so that's coming up in a month. And then we do the big show, as you talked about, September 8th through 11th. That's in Cleveland, Ohio. 
Um, contentmarketingworld.com is all the information. We still have an early bird going on till the end of May, I believe, that you can get a discounted pass on. So I'd love to see you there. Uh, contentmarketinginstitute.com, that's where we have the online training. And then if you really look, anybody that's looking for how do I get better in this content marketing thing and understand it, whether you're a small business or a large enterprise, we just subscribe to our daily or weekly updates on Content Marketing Institute. We try to give away the best information we can so that you can learn about the practice of, of content marketing. And, uh, and so hopefully, you know, if you don't have a content marketing strategy, that's what I want you to get. Stop doing all that content. Uh, and start figuring out what your strategy is first. Yeah, and everyone should check out. I mean, we just even even with this amount of time scratch the surface, and you know, there's so much great information. Epic content marketing book that you know people need to to check it out and and listen to it or read it. Um, Joe, my last question for you is, you know, I find with a lot of the the companies that are on the East Coast, West Coast, tell me about how it is being in Cleveland. Because you don't hear many companies, I'm from Cleveland. Um, you don't. Uh, we're trying to change that. You uh, are? Uh, well, that's one of the reasons. I mean, I'm a big uh, Cleveland proponent. I'm one of the Cleveland champions to try to help bring new events into Cleveland. Uh, I, I love this area. Uh, I've been to, uh, I've been to you know, hundreds of cities around the world, and Cleveland is home. It's, I mean, most people don't realize we've got the water here, the, outside of the fact that it's freezing. <laughs> It's been I'm in Chicago, here. so it's freezing. Yeah, it's so you know, you're going yeah. through the same thing. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I think that what we can do today from a business standpoint, you don't, I mean, traditionally, if it was 10 years ago, people would have said that if you're a media company, you had to be in New York. You, know, you, can, you can do a business anywhere. That's what I love about it. We, can, we work with, we have people that we work with in Boston and Detroit and down south and in Los Angeles and Australia and Slovenia. And we're working with people all over the place. You can do that today. And I think that why would you set up a business, a media business in New York, like down, why would you pay that overhead? Why would you risk that for your business if you don't have to? Mm -hmm. So the biggest, the best decision we've never made, I know we didn't talk about it, was not getting uh, office space and working a virtual environment. Uh, that has helped us. It's never been a detriment to our business, even though we work with big customers. They all understand it, and it works really well, and I think that's a competitive advantage for us. Yeah. That looks like a big office space you're in, though. It's pretty open. This is home. This oh, is, really? Oh, okay. This is, this is, actually, this is downstairs. I'm, I'm using the kids. Uh, this is, you've got lots of Doctor Who and Minecraft. Uh, here, there's a little little Minecraft dude here. I oh, got it. So I got a little Doctor Who portal here. So I was using the while the kids are at school. I'm I'm using there. It looks like a boardroom in the back with the big big glass window. I'll have to hey I'll have to do it more often. I'll put a little orange over here and we'll be set to right, go right. with our uh, with our interviews. Well, Joe, I want to be the first to thank you. I've really appreciated talking and thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Jeremy. Good luck and keep doing your thing. Thank you.